So just as a brief introduction, so uh, we're Team Kappa. I'm Volo, I used to work in banking previously. I, I'm Ivan, I used to do sell-side equity research before. I'm Isla, I used to be in private banking. And I'm John, uh, I used to work in this management. Uh, so today we're presenting a, a buy recommendation for Revlon 2021 bonds uh, with a target price of 97. Um, our case is built around three main theses. So first one is improving fundamentals. Um, second one is high expected value uh, in a refinancing and limited uh, um, kind of risk and a downside. Uh, and then we'll start with an introduction to the company and go into more into the bonds themselves. Yes, yeah, so as for the company overview of Revlon, uh, as you probably heard of the name before, it manufactures and sells beauty and personal care products worldwide. And currently roughly half of its sales comes from the international segment and the other half comes from North America. So um, besides its flagship Revlon brand and its portfolio, it also owns a product line of nail care, hair care, and licensed fragrances. And in 2016, it acquired the 109-year-old beauty company Elizabeth Arden for $870 million. So look into a little bit more about what we are recommending. These are the Revlon 2021 senior unsecured bonds with a five and three quarters coupon. Um, total value is about 500 million. And where do we sit in the capital structure? So we are junior to a revolver, asset backed loan, and a term loan facility, which represent about $2 billion in total debt. Um, in addition to our notes, there's also 2024 bonds that were issued as part of the Elizabeth Arden 2016 acquisition. Uh, that was about 450 million. So in total, this company's well as uh close to nine times. And as a result of this leverage, as well as expectations of not being able to fully realize synergies, uh, our bonds face some downgrades. February 2018, Moody's downgraded us to CAA3, and S&P downgraded us to C. And in the bottom left, I have some not too positive commentary from them. And this view is supported by the markets over the past trading year um, since the downgrade happened. Currently, we're priced at 86.55, with uh, giving us a yield to, to worst of 13.6%. Yeah, so um, let's start off with our first investment thesis as to why we think we should long Revlon. So um, first, it will be uh, our views that uh, its fundamentals are improving. So um, we think the sales hub for Revlon is going to be Elizabeth Arden. So in the last quarter of results, uh, Elizabeth Arden net sales was a 16.5% uh, increase compared to the same period prior year, mainly due to its strong online capability and success in the China market. So the global beauty market is still growing at a fast rate, but sales from online channels are growing four times faster than stationary stores. And Elizabeth Arden has been successful in launching several digital uh, localized marketing initiatives, which has been driving their international growth, especially in China. So um, the sales of Elizabeth Arden skincare products have consistently come top 10 in multiple e-commerce platforms in China. And we think that it can continue the sales momentum because of the aging population, the growing interest in physical appearances, as well as its uh, unique positioning as an affordable, luxurious Western brand that's able to meet the trend of an increased disposal income in emerging markets. So um, besides sales growth, Revlon is also implementing cost reduction plans and still realizing its cost reduction synergies from Elizabeth Arden. So um, the business optimization plan that they announced in, uh, in late 2018 <coughs> It will involve a restructuring cost of uh, 30 to 40 million, which is a one-time charge. And uh, by end of 2019, they're expecting to realize an annual cost reduction of 125 to 150 million. And we're positive that they'll be able to realize this because Revlon does have a huge portfolio of brands that requires clean up and processes to be streamlined. And as for Elizabeth Arden, the company has been incurring a high integration cost uh, since the acquisition in 2016, but the company expects to deliver an annual cost reduction of 190 million by end of 2020. So um, essentially for Revlon, much of its current financial performance is dragged down by the heavy front-loaded expense uh, from all these different initiatives in which return can be realized in the next year or, so, or two. 
So as Ayla pointed out, uh, our expectations of sales growth for the company allowed us uh, to expect uh, growth accelerating to a long-term rate of 4%, uh, 4% which is the uh, market expectation for the uh, of growth rate. Also, uh, as we expect uh, improvements in terms of the cost structure and the company was successful in integrating and extracting the cost synergies previously with, with its previous acquisitions, that allowed us to increase their growth margins and uh, operating margins. Uh, all that put into context of a financial model uh, makes us uh, believers in uh, Revlon generating net income uh, in 2020 and their free cash flow becoming positive as early as next year, 2019. Sorry, second thesis is that we expect a high value recovery in a refinancing case. Um, so why do they need to refinance? So four main points. Uh, one is they have a low liquidity, so they only have about 68 million cash, not much capacity to borrow uh, beyond that on their revolvers. Um, they have a lot of debt, gross debt, so they're very levered, so they cannot take on um, new incremental debt, or at least a lot of it. Um, a third point is that the bonds that, that are maturing 21, they have the most restrictive uh, language in the covenants, so um, taking those out will give them more flexibility in terms of what they can do with their capital structure going forward. And then lastly, if they don't take them out or they don't refinance, uh, then the term loan of 1.7 billion jumps 90 days in front of the bonds, creating a, a high uh, maturity wall, which they would want to avoid. So how do we see this refinancing playing out? And a lot of what I'm gonna talk about right now is gonna be very similar to what Ron Mass talked about uh, just over lunch. So I'm gonna take you guys back to March 2017, J. Crew at the time had just issued new debt on IP assets that they had spun out from their restricted subsidiaries, asset stripping, or as he referred to it, asset transfers. Now, why were they able to do this? We covenants. They were able to, through a two-step process, from a restricted subsidiary to unrestricted subsidiary, take out their IP assets. These now, the existing lenders would now be subordinated to new debt that was issued on these on their IP. Not good for those uh, previous holders. Um, they tried to sue and they were unsuccessful. Uh, that was overturned. Um, so why are we talking about J. Crew? Well, Revlon has very similar language, if not worse for the current holders. Um, and the markets are fairly aware of this. I have a couple headlines from uh, the view that this is likely to happen for Revlon. And that ratings downgrade that I referred to earlier by Moody's, a little conspiracy theory, but it happened days after the Bloomberg article came out. So this is well uh, known by the markets. Yeah, so um, how will the refinance actually work um, and how it's maybe different perhaps to some other more scary cases is that there's a, there's a cap uh, in the covenants of how much assets, uh, how many assets they can transfer. So the amount is roughly 380 million, uh, and these are likely be IP assets. Uh, they can transfer them into their either um, non-guarantor subsidiaries, which are their foreign subsidiaries, or their unrestricted subsidiaries. Um, at the foreign subs, they can only raise up to 485 million uh, worth of debt, whereas at the unrestricted ones, they can raise an unlimited amount. So we think, although they can raise debt in, um, you know, with both structures, we think likely one is the unrestricted one because it allows them to raise an unlimited amount of debt. And using the cash proceeds, they'll be able to then refinance um, our bonds. Um, in a downside case, we looked at a, a restructuring, possibly in 2020. Uh, we did a comparable analysis uh, of uh, companies in the in, in space, and we came up with a multiple of roughly nine times. Um, in this case, the recovery on our notes um, after the secured ones um, uh, would be 82%, which is pretty much in line with where the bonds are currently trading. So uh, our downside risk would be protected. Yeah, so when it comes to the risks pertaining to this particular case, uh, it's fair to say that since half uh, of the sales of the company come from the uh, developer markets, uh, sales in dollar terms uh, were somewhat lowered by the strong dollar of, over the couple of last years. But now that the Fed is less certain uh, in terms of further increasing its rates, 
we believe that the risk of the uh, basically the headwind to the uh, headwind uh, currency risk to their sales is, is somewhat mitigated nowadays. Also, we, we believe and we will like their uh, proven uh, track record in uh, integrating companies before. So we believe uh, the risk of unrealized uh, cost synergies in case of Revlon is somewhat diminished to, to other uh, folks. Uh, and finally, uh, I would also mention that there is a definitely shift in the market uh, of companies entering the natural products uh, segment. And in that regard, Revlon uh, is catching up and Elizabeth Arden is, is part of that uh, effort. So we believe that, again, uh, it's not that of an issue as it might look initially. And so there is risk that Ron Perlman may just try to buy this company. He's currently an 85% owner. Uh, he's increased his stake a little bit uh, over the past couple of years. and. In response to this action, uh, a minority shareholder, Middleman Brothers, then about 5%, uh, they sent a letter to the board requesting them to get an agreement with Perelman to basically confirm that they're not, he's not going to breach the 90% threshold of ownership, which would allow him to do a short form, short form merger in a shareholder vote. Um, this was initiated in September of 2017 for one year, extended through September 2019 uh, once that one year expired. Yeah, and lastly, there's also, you know, the obvious refinancing risk, but we think that's mitigated because the new bondholders will receive uh, priority in the capital structure um, going forward. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. We're ready to take your questions. So I think it's, uh, it's clever in thinking about how they can utilize, or probably can utilize the baskets, and it's definitely his MO to try to come up with creative ways uh, around, um, or basically to extend his option in the equity. So you said they can transfer 380 million to an unrestricted subsidiary through the IC basket. They have to address a $500 million bond. So what is what would be the plan to get effectively 500 million of value or basically try to defease a $500 million liability when you only have freed up 380 of, of asset value. Right. Um, so we think there'll be a guarantee from Revlon Consumer Products Code to the unrestricted sub. That would give um, the new bondholders not only priority on capital in the IP situation, but also have a parent guarantee as well. So they'll, they'll have priority. And they have debt and currency capacity under uh, the liabilities that sit within that box to incur or to provide a guarantee to this box? Right, so they'll be able to yeah, so provide a guarantee. Uh, yeah. So what happens next then? Because they have a maturity wall right after uh, within the secured part of the structure, correct? With the term on A tranche. Mm -hmm. So you just took assets away from the collateral package of the first lien lenders. Now you're going to go back to them and ask them to help you out. So what, what's the plan there? Um, yeah, so we think, uh, I mean, first of all, when these bonds are taken out, um, the covenants become less restrictive. So the other um, entities, they don't have as restrictive covenants. So there's a lot of uh, kind of flexibility with what uh, Revlon can do in terms of changing the structure and thereby incentivizing uh, the term loans. So they could shift things out more, but they just can't do it because they're restricted now with these bonds. So. By taking them out, they'll have more opportunities to, um, you know, change the security, you know, structure or do other kind of capital structure work, um, you know, to incentivize the term loans. But, um, you know, they're also amortizing, so um, that that debt gets paid down. So in addition to just the interest payments, um, and and again, and we think it'll be able to generate, you know, decent free cash flow as well, just to pay down that debt, um, you know, in twenty twenty one. Could you just expand on that then? How do you I mean, you just ripped out these assets and theoretically took them away from the term loan lenders. What, what could you offer them to incentivize them uh, you know, to fall with the um, Well, we think also uh, the assets that will be stripped away are IP assets. These aren't the primary assets secure in the term loans. So term loans are secured by you know, receivables and you know, other assets. So we think... Um, the terminals themselves, they have a lot of protection as, as it is. So 
we're not sure that, I mean, although it's probably a negative still for the term loans to transfer, it's probably not a significant negative in our view. Um, and again, there's, we're really focusing on the bond here. So we're betting on the refinance. So what happens with the company later on, I think we're still, we're still positive. We think there's going to be good cash flow. And again, there's flexibility in the capital structure, but um, you know, we're really focused on the bond, I think, and how it's going to behave. Where do the 24s trade, the uh, unsecured 24s? Yeah, so those trade right now about high 50s. Um, so the, the yield on those is uh, quite a bit higher, right? I'm curious as to thinking about what your 82 cent downside case, if this doesn't work out, you know, the 24s, I think, are implying that recovery is a lot lower, right? At that part of the structure. Um, You know, I guess I'm just thinking through whether the downside is as protected if, you know, they probably attempt to do this, the first thing sue them to do it, you go to a lengthy litigation, you're proven that you actually were not, you didn't have the capacity to do it or, you know, whatever. And then, you know, you're now trading at 50 cents on the dollar. So just thinking about the upside downside, you know, you're, how, how are you thinking about that? in light of the fact that those 24, why are the 24s trading at 50 then if the recovery on the unsecured is equal to? Yeah, I mean, so in our case, again, we assumed that, um, you know, we're looking at the 2021 specifically. So we think that there's risk for the 2024s because if assets get stripped, they have less protection. So for them, I think, you know, they should be trading lower, but the 2021 bond, we think that the play here is just totally different. So, so the market's um, appreciating what you're, the market's pricing this in a little bit. It's, def it's definitely looking at it, right? Yeah. And to, between the two, uh, as Will touched on earlier, there is more of an incentive to, incentive to refinance the 21s before that maturity wall comes up as opposed to the 24, 24s. So for example, we, when we started looking at this bond in December, it's trading at 75, not trading at 80 or six, right? So, um, so it picked up since then, but we still like it at 86. And the yields between the two over the last month or so have deviated a bit. Um, where those have been relatively steady, ours have, the yields uh, have come down. You guys thought about a slowdown in China and how that might impact growth of your top line revenue. Um, and have, have you done any stress testing on how much of an impact they could take? Um, so, we did perform a stress testing, but then uh, as you can see, the sales momentum has been phenomenal in China market. And uh, so if you go back to the... Uh, <coughs> yes, so, um, so here on the bottom right chart, we have a um, sales growth of Elizabeth Arden and uh, Asia segment in particular. So you can see that in the last quarter, they actually had a 40% increase uh, growth rate. So even if that slowed down a little bit, we think that uh, it still provides a good uh, sales growth for Revlon overall. And also at the same time is that um, the e-commerce platform in China is growing a lot faster than, um, than other channels, uh, other distribution channels. And that uh, Elizabeth Arden is one of the few major brands that's able to uh, navigate the China digital market. And so uh, we think that is a very good uh, sales hook for uh, Revlon. Following the uh, Arden acquisition in 2016, did gross margins and margins across the board really just really drop? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you? Um, think they'll address that and um, you know is there is there something wrong with the Arden assets that's causing those margins to drop uh, which is clearly putting the pressure pressure on EBITDA yeah so as we mentioned before a lot of these charges are really one-time charges uh, like a lot of research analysts have also questioned Revlon on this on their earnings call but then if we actually strip out those one-time charges then uh, the EBITDA margin is actually only down 0.9% uh, mm -hmm. as compared to the same quarter last year. And so, um, so as we mentioned, a lot of their current financial performances is really being dragged down by these heavy front-loaded expenses. But even in your projections, the 
gross margins don't improve back to where they were pre-acquisition? Well, that's because we were kind of conservative. So can you, can you get back to the previous slide? So we actually incorporated only the, 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 the first initiative fully. Uh, and uh, we, we basically, we tried to be conservative in that sense. So we, we, we decided that we believe in the management when it comes to their, their cost optimization plan for 2018. But for the synergies, we decided that maybe, it's, it's also hard, hard to uh, judge like, what what is the base level to which we need to kind of uh, make the adjustment of of their of their expectations of synergies? So we, we decided to be conservative in that sense and only went with 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 one of the problems in our focus. In terms of capex, it looks like twenty seventeen it was one oh eight, and then you're sort of projecting sort of fifty eight. But will that be enough to grow international e commerce? Do you need more infrastructure, or what's that assuming? Well, we we assume that yes. So we know that for three quarters of 2019, this is this is kind of the annualist number they should come up with this year, around 60 million. And so we assume that they, uh, as I mentioned, so they pre-invested. Pre in previous year in 2017, in, uh, 17, but now their kind of run rate uh, capex should be around 60%. And uh, when we uh, look at it in the relative terms in, in relation to their sales uh, and their EBITDA, it's actually on par with, with what they used to have previously. <clears throat> so we, we, we believe that the that 2017 investment was kind of uh their best shot and now they just need to maintain that and kind of growth and, and for maintenance so this is this is basically maintenance kind of started starting this year so the current price is 86 at what price are you no longer bullish on this credit we target price 97 so anything i guess um you know leading up to that um or, or, or above it will be probably less attractive, but. And then um, if this was in a fund, what would you tell your investors in terms of the market, market uh, like risk that they would need to have an appetite for in order to want to help <coughs> you and, and ride this along until? Sure. Um, I mean, we think, uh, you know, it's a, it's a high yield, obviously, from your credit. Um, you know, but there's always a potential for restructuring. Um, so it's obviously on them. Kind of a higher is a risk end of the spectrum, uh, but we think again um, that specifically the twenty one bond it has a lot of protection because you know it has a lot of leverage over the capital structure just by, by the nature of the covenants and where it sits and the need for the company to continue its business to just take it out. So um, you know although you know we do see that there are some risks if it goes into restructuring liquidation perhaps we think that scenario is unlikely to happen. Uh, you know, with our bonds still being in, in place there. And the timing of this play, you know, it's, it's relatively set. You know, uh, a refinancing or these things being paid out at par, it's going to happen within two years. We're going to know something within that time, short time period. Um, yeah, so the duration is pretty, pretty short as well. Has there been any talk in the market about uh, <coughs> someone buying debt or the company buying back debt at a discount? That um, there has been research on that. There has been research, but research thinks that uh, these bonds have enough leverage where they shouldn't really take anything below par. Um, that's <coughs> kind of what the market view is. Yeah. yeah, a little bit, but really not too much substantial. Same with like the Paralympic takeover. Rumor at this point, nothing really substantial besides him just increasing his ownership. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mitchell Altsteer. This is Angela, James, and Kartik. We are Team Alpha. Uh, today, Team Alpha is pitching Dean Foods. Uh, this is the second largest dairy processor and distributor in the United States. 
Uh, based on our research and analysis, uh, we believe that the senior 2023 unsecured bonds are deeply undervalued by the market for the following four reasons. Uh, one, management is accelerating cost cutting initiatives. Uh, two, the market is overlooking actionable growth opportunities, and, and this company has a, a track record of scaling nascent brands. Three, uh, despite continued revenue, uh, excuse me, despite continued volume softness, uh, prices appear to have stabilized in the last couple months, uh, indicating overall market stabilization. And lastly, even in an aggressive bear case scenario, this business is cash flow positive, has ample liquidity, and extremely high liquidation value. Um, I just want to point out a couple of things on this slide. I know there's a lot going on. Um, sales by product is in the bottom left. Uh, so this is mostly a milk company. They have other products as well, but we're focusing a lot of our analysis on milk. Um, next to that is customers. So Dean Foods sells to a variety of different types of customers. Some of their top customers are grocers. Uh, their top customers, Walmart, fiscal year uh, 18, 10K came out last night. It's about 15% of sales. Um, that is germane because uh, among the grocers, they've been competing pretty aggressively on price of foot traffic drivers. So think bread, think eggs, and most importantly, think milk. So this has uh, detrimentally affected Dean and its peers uh, for the last couple of years, although this, uh, this appears to be subsiding over the last couple of months based on um, IRI data we found from Nielsen. Um, and then another important point on this slide is Walmart has spent the past two years building and ramping their own milk uh, processing and distribution facility in Indiana. Uh, this will eventually service 10% of Walmart stores, principally in the Midwest. Um, we can talk more about this later. So recent news has been, uh, shall we say, eventful. Um, Dean Foods engaged Evercore a few days ago, the day after Q4 earnings came out. We believe these earnings uh, were deeply misunderstood by the street uh, because for the most part, these earnings were really just a continuation of Dean Foods turnaround strategy and their cost cutting initiatives. Uh, they also slashed the dividend, uh, which we view as a huge positive. There's no reason they should be paying a dividend while they're going through this turnaround strategy. Um, this slide is really just to give you an idea of how large Dean Foods is. Um, so they, they supply one third of US liquid milk in the US, um, uh, which is just a lot of milk. Um, and you guys might recognize some of these brands over here depending on uh, you know, where you grew up and where you're from. A couple points on this slide, a couple key takeaways. Uh, first and foremost, about two thirds of Dean's cost of goods sold um, are the price that they pay the farmers for milk. We'll call this class one, uh, class one milk prices. Um, this price is set on a monthly basis by the USDA it's this really Byzantine formula that I'm happy to elaborate on um, in the Q&A period. But um, yeah, long story short is this is set by the government. This is a kind of a commodity. Uh, another key takeaway from this slide is um, consumers, uh, until a few months ago, they've spent the last few years kind of shifting towards plant-based and nut-based milk alternatives. So this has uh, really affected volumes in the industry. I'm gonna hand things over to Angela. So here's our base case financial summary. We factor in the normalization of class one milk price and the dropping EBITDA. Also, what we want to highlight is that in, even in our bear case, where we forecast, we apply around 40% discount to the street consensus EBITDA, Dean Food still managed to service its debt and maintenance capex. Here's a summary of the capital structure. Dean Foods 23 bonds sit behind the um, revolver and account receivable securitization facility. As of end 2018, Dean Foods has a net debt of around 177 million, implying a multiple of six, even a multiple of 6.5, which we think is reasonable given its rating and troughing EBITDA. Moving on to the investment thesis, the first thesis we have is we expect to see accelerating progress on cost-cutting initiatives. Dean Foods has rolled out an enterprise-wide cost productivity plan since 2018. This plan has three key areas. Firstly, to rescale the supply chain through consolidating plants. They've closed seven plants in third quarter within six weeks. And we expect to see at least 100 basis points in improvements in gross margin in the next two years. And secondly, 
to implement a linear organizational structure through cutting headcount costs. This is already reflected in a 40 basis point drop in GNA expenses as a percentage of revenue. And certainly to optimize spend management through centralized uh, purchasing efforts. Based on our estimate, we think the company has executed around 30 million savings in 2018. And under our base case scenario, we made a conservative forecast that the company will realize another 80 million savings in the next two years, which brings the total savings to 110 million out of the 150 million targeted by the company. In that, we expand the total savings from the saving initiatives and also the cost normalization to offset the revenue loss, which ultimately leads to increases in EBITDA of around 40 million in the next two years. I'll pass over to James to talk about our second thesis. Right. Um, so our second thesis is about overlooked revenue growth opportunities as well as margin st stabilization. So Dean Food has historically been very capable of de developing young brands. This is evidenced by their purchase of Silk back in the 2000s and grew the brand from 30 million annual revenue to 350 million in three years. And Silk eventually became a 2 billion annual revenue brand back before Dean Food sold it uh, back in 2000. The 13. So uh, very similarly, uh, in the past two years, Dean Food has made acquisitions such as Good Karma uh, Foods, which is flaxseed-based milk brands, and a revenue of 20 million, as well as Uncle Matt's, which is a organic juice maker, and a revenue of um, 10 million. So they're very comparable brands um, to uh, back when Dean Food got uh, Silk in the 2000s, and they're very they're pretty much positioned to take advantage of some of the growth opportunities and non-dairy milk, uh, non -dairy milk uh, sectors. Um, we also think that the market may have misunderstood some of the uh, impact uh, from a loss of Walmart relationship. This is largely because the management has not been very actively disclosing the impact uh, through the communication. But uh, through our own analysis, by removing factors such as seafloor decline in volume and change in price, we essentially conclude that the impact from Walmart relationship loss is about 1% on, on their top line which is below street's consensus. Um, lastly, um, Dean Food has historically been very capable of maintaining their margin, even when the cost of milk surged. So think about like the, the three periods uh, in, the, in the past five years where milk price has, uh, has increased. So 2013 to 2014, uh, milk price increased by 30%. Their average EBIT, to EBIT per gallon was 3 cents. 2015 and 2016, milk price both increased by less than 10%, and their average EBIT per gallon was actually $0.08, cents, which is higher than their long-term average of $0.07 cents per gallon. Um, so it's with these numbers that, that we feel comfortable about Dean Food's capability of navigating through a high-cost high um, environment. Um, so the third part of our thesis is about long-term uh, uh, demand stabilization as well as cost stabilization. So we noticed that the, the pop, uh, percentage of population that are 65 uh, years and older are going to uh, increase from 15% right now to 25% in the next uh, 10 years, in the next 15 years. So this group of people are, uh, their, their demand for dairy milk is much more predictable than uh, 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 younger generations. So this is one of the reasons why we believe for the long term, demand uh, for dairy milk is going to stabilize. Um, on the cost side, the uh, U.S. in general has been oversupplying milk for the past couple of years, largely due to the fact that uh, production per cow has been improving due to technology um, and various reasons. So it is this oversupply of milk that, that we think is essentially going to uh, offset some of the inflationary pressure on milk costs and help uh, uh, milk producers such as Dean Foods to continue to stabilize their, their margin. And with that, I'll pass over to Claudia. For the final part, part of our investment thesis, we look at the company's liquidity position and its salvage value in relation to its debt position. As displayed in the slide, even in a very conservative pair case scenario, which is essentially EBITDA 40% less than consensus forecast, Dean Foods continues to remain cash flow positive and neutral all the way through 2023. Uh, also, the company has an uh, additional $260 million liquidity in the form of a, a revolver facility. Furthermore, Given that there's no debt maturing prior to 2023, this gives the company a long runway and the management enough of a breathing room to be able to turn the operations around. 
Finally, we believe that based on our primary research, the market does not account for a very strong liquidation value, both in a chapter 11 and chapter seven bankruptcy scenarios uh, for the senior unsecures. First, the liquidation. Dean Foods, just by its sheer scale and size, controls a significant portion of the US uh, dairy infrastructure. And it is for this reason we believe that Dean Foods will remain a going concern or most of its assets will continue to remain in use. So uh, Dean Foods uh, has close to $600 million in accounts receivable, which accounts for close to 50% of their liquidation value. Furthermore, the, the bulk of the remaining liquidation value comes from uh, so-called refrigerator trucks, uh, which is about 5,000 in fleet, uh, which we're happy to discuss further. Finally, in a chapter 11 going concern scenario, even at a 50% discount valuation discount to its peers, there is close to complete uh, capital preservation. We want to expand a little bit on the bear case scenario. As you can see, uh, this, uh, the bonds are currently trading at 73 cents on the dollar, and there's 68% uh, recovery in a bear case. So while constructing this bear, bear, bear case scenario, our assumption was to uh, hit uh, a flat, like close to zero flat EBIT per gallon, which is a key metric that industry experts uh, follow. Implicit in, in, the, in constructing our, uh, our bear case scenario is the close to 2 to 3% volume decline uh, for the next several years in the, uh, for Dean Foods and uh, close to zero uh, cost cutting flowing through uh, that we've discussed earlier. Finally, we've identified a, a, a few key risks to our investment thesis. One, a faster ramp up of vertical integration from uh, leading grocers such as Walmart than we've accounted for. Two, a significant spike in demand for private labels, uh, non-dairy and healthier alternatives to milk. Third, an increasing milk cost that we've not forecast. Although we believe that there's strong mitigants to each of these and we've accounted for all of these in our base and bear case scenarios, we're happy to discuss, discuss this further. To summarize, one, the turnaround plan continues to uh, make progress through uh, cost cutting initiatives and revenue growth opportunities in key sub-segments. Two, uh, the market is overreacting to the risk of uh, its key customers, such as large retailers, such as Walmart, uh, ramping up their vertical integration plans. Three, long-term stabilization in industry demand and costs. And Teen Foods has a demonstrated history of showing strong positivity, uh, strong, strong positive profitability in uh, unstable periods. Four, we believe that the market is significantly discounting the strong liquidation value. And for these four reasons, we believe that this is a great investment opportunity. Thank you. Comps in terms of uh, spreads or yield metrics? Uh, we didn't dig super deep into some peers. I mean, like, uh, so I've seen a lot of analysis on um, relative value, but this is like such kind of an idio idiosyncratic business going through kind of idiosyncratic things with its largest customer vertically integrating. Uh, I didn't think it was a great, I don't know, it wasn't a terrific use of time from, from our perspective. We, I mean, we looked preliminarily, but we didn't present any analysis. But yeah, we have we have comps here, mostly pure play providers, and then obviously craft foods is, is a little more diversified. So looking at uh, the forecasts here and the free cash flow, if I'm reading this correctly, are you guys anticipating reading this trade something on the order of hundred million per year? Um, which uh, which page slide are you at? twenty seven? Sorry, that's the bold scenario. Uh, I think base is uh, like anywhere from. 37 to 60 million a year? Yeah, that's right. Okay, what, what do you think they're gonna do with that free cash flow? What, um, what's gonna be the use? And the only reason I bring that up is that there's not that much prepayable debt in the cap structure, so. Right. Um, part of that, they, they, uh, they do have drawn, they have drawn uh, about 180 million of revolver uh, for, for the year of 2018. So I think at least for near term, they, they will be able they will be using that cash to actually reduce that their revolver. And they do have a uh, credit covenants that's restricting, restricting them on, I guess, uh, the kind of leverage they, they, they can take. 
So the more they, they can reduce that leverage, the, the less likelihood, even even when they experience a, uh, I guess, a negative uh, year on, on EBITDA, they'll, they'll, they'll still be able to survive that, that period. And uh, what has management historically done with free cash flow? So they paid out dividend. So they paid out dividends yeah, so for if, an extremely long time. Yeah, um, if you look at in the beginning of the, uh, oh, it's not. So on the, um, so if you look at 2014 to 2017, a lot of their uh, free cash flow has been going into uh, one of them acquisitions. So like I said in, in, in the beginning, they acquired two brands uh, in the past two years. Uh, they've been they've been giving out, I guess, 32 million of uh, dividends every year, and they have been buying back, uh, I guess, uh, that as well. I would add one more point. The um uh, they, they had a credit amendment uh, a couple of days ago, um, and one of the clauses was that they have a springing fixed charge covenant ratio on their um, on their revolver, and they only get credit for the first 25 million. So they, they don't have any kind of incentive to kind of build up cash. Like they would they would use it for some productive purpose. Do you have a sense of what the street is thinking Walmart could actually do? Uh, you guys, um, uh, pitch 10, uh, you know, show that the impact from customer loss seems pretty modest. Uh, right. You know, what, what do you think they're so afraid of? Do you think they uh, the street thinks Walmart's going <coughs> to expand in a big way, or uh, you know, or is it just perception, uh, difference in perception? Sure. Do you want to? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Um, Basically, I think the street is thinking that management or, or that um, that Walmart is going to kind of scale this across the country. Uh, we completely disagree for a handful of reasons. Um, one is given uh, given Walmart's size and scope, um, why would they have only kind of launched one location in a very specific spot like the Midwest so they could service ten percent of their stores? If they were going to, and they spent two years kind of ramping this up, if they were going to do this, I think they would have they would have announced this already that they were going to completely vertically integrate. Um, I just don't think it's cost effective for Walmart to do that, even though they're building a plant that's about twice the size of a lot of Dean Foods locations. Um, another point is it takes a long time to scale, um, scale these dairy processing facilities. And, you know, these bonds mature in four years. So, like, how much damage could they actually do? And then the third, I think the most important reason why, why we, we feel strongly that Walmart's not going to do this is because this is an extremely low ROIC business, subject to commodity risk. Um, Walmart would essentially be destroying shareholder value by kind of Making these huge upfront capital investments, high fixed cost, um, and and vertically integrating that way, like kind of across the country. Like if I were a man, if I were a Walmart shareholder, I would not be pleased with with them getting into this business in a big way. So I think the the saving grace for this business over the last four years, so it's in secular decline, but milk prices have been relatively stable. Right, twenty fourteen was the last sort of dislocation in that market. You clearly have identified that they're pretty much cash flow break even um, under your base case. So, can you just talk about their ability to withstand a shock to milk prices? What that sort of means in terms of the solvency of the business, um, uh, your recovery scenario, and then I guess another thing I just to educate me on it: just what is the backdrop for the sort of milk milk market right now? Why have prices been so stable, and what? might disrupt that. Sure. Uh, so as you can see in this uh, chart, uh, so everything after 2018 is clearly uh, some sort of a, a forecast. So we've looked at information put out by the USDA and Food and Agriculture Price Research Institute that, that gives out like price estimates going forward. So we are accounting for close to uh, like 2% increase, which is quite stable over the next over the, like next several years. So primarily in the past, you can see there's like a divergent relationship between like the uh, class one milk price and the gross margin. So Dean Foods has had a history of being able to sustain uh, increased periods, uh, sustain uh, periods of increased uh, uh, milk price. However, if, if the like the longer the, the the milk price has stayed higher, the at the during the later stages of the period of high milk price, they've kind of suffered in EBIT per gallon, uh, which is like the key metric that industry looks at. So in our uh, pair case. Uh, and base case scenario, like we were kind of targeting at what level and what would it take 
for the uh, market to have uh, like a zero EBIT per gallon. So the Indian fish have a zero EBIT per gallon, right? And most of it like is, is coming from like a secular decline and nothing from like a shock to the milk price. And we've looked at uh, the corn prices and uh, the prices of animal feed uh, in uh, the future contracts on those. And we believe that there's strong reason that the, this, the, the milk price will remain stable. And furthermore, uh, the right now, like there's an oversupply of milk in, in, the, in the United States, which is offset by inflation. Uh, like over the next several years, we, we believe that this is going to flatten out. Does that answer all your questions? <laughs> Yeah, the um, I'm just looking at a, a bond that's trading at seventy cents on the dollar. Clearly, it's not pricing in anything to do with volatility in milk prices, right? Because that input, at least, but at least as far as the market's concerned, has been extremely stable. And if that's the forecast, just thinking what happens to the bond if you actually start seeing some volatility in, in the input prices pick up, sort of compounding a secular declining business that doesn't generate free cash flow, and and sort of what. What might transpire, you know, at least on a market to market basis? I guess maybe you think there's sufficient value on the other end, yeah, you know, um, bankruptcy process or restructuring. Um, but yeah, just thinking through what um, shakeup in the import prices would oh. do to a very thin margin of safety type of yeah, type um, business models. You know. Actually, just like, I would like to add on to that. What I'd like to add on to that is that um, when we look past and in the, in the history, even when like it's times when milk price is volatile, I think as long as it's not a spike like like we had in in, in, in five years ago, I think the food has been sort of capable of passing on that uh, volatility in milk price to the downstream uh, retailers. Uh, obviously, when when you have a spike, then there, there's a there's a period of time where they have to play the catch up game. So you will probably see kind of the earnings or cash flow suffer, but um, looking just looking past in the history, I, I think that that time has been uh, that that's just temporary, I, I guess. Also, and the management has spoken like in running calls about like their contracts with Walmart, etc., being like having like clauses to be able to pass pass the cost downstream. So there's probably going to be like a, a quarter or two lag, but eventually they should be able to pass pass them down. Looking at your EBITDA bridge, just want to understand the logic behind the secular milk decline. You're assuming. So we're factoring in a probably 2% decline in the volume. So that's pretty much what shows in the revenue top line. And in terms of removal of fixed costs, those are just factory shutdowns? Yes, that's according to companies' disclosure in the past several quarters. So we actually, we just, we are factoring probably half of the, half of the recovery of the transactor costs. So that's a very conservative forecast. I think the toughest thing with secularly, secularly declining businesses is trying to really handicap what the pace of that decline is. You know, you think you know what it is, and then you take another step function down. Okay. This is just for, <coughs> for exercise purposes. How are you getting comfortable that this is a 2% decline type volume business going forward, and why? So I think the... I think this is kind of a key slide in that. So as long as Dean's is a going concern, um, they're going to have a ton of assets. It's a very asset intensive business. They've um, they've made a good amount of investment over in recent years. They haven't like slashed CapEx more than they should have. So that's why we spent a ton of work kind of verifying what some of these assets are and what they're worth um, in a liquidation scenario. So um, the bonds are currently, uh, as of I don't know, 36 hours ago, they're trading at 73 ish so you have about five points downside um and from what we view as kind of pretty conservative in terms of uh liquidation value of pp &E, which i can talk about in a second but uh so you have about five points downside uh worst case scenario you have secular decline chapter seven um and then you have about 50 55 points upside um four years of, of six and a half coupon plus price appreciation um and then just to drill in a little bit on pp and &E, kind of where we get this, this 411. Um, we spoke with uh, we spoke with the gentleman that ran uh, Hostess's uh, liquidation of 3,500 of their trucks, all of their assets. This was back in 2013, 2014. Uh, we spoke with Penske's uh, national fleet sale. So he sells he sells used trucks, reefer, tr reefer trucks, refrigerated trucks, 
um, to, uh, to a variety of corporations. Um, he gave us some estimates. He basically said that if you have a high mileage truck, so think like 250, 300,000 miles on this truck, um, five to seven years old, you can sell those from between 55 and $40,000. Um, so we wanted to be conservative, so we took 42 and a half and kind of showed the full scale of recovery on the senior unsecureds, depending on where you fall out in there, because they have about 5,000 trucks that they own. So um, anyway, so long story short is we did a good amount of work on liquidation. That's why we feel fairly comfortable with the downside. And uh, I guess just to address your question on the demand, I think when we look at the demographic change in the next, let's say, five to 10 years, I guess the, the group of people that's going to continue drinking milk is, is the, the, the senior. And when we look at how much milk consum consumption has changed for, I guess, groups that are 65 years older or compared to a group of people that are like zero to like 20 years older, like, um, the younger people definitely would ha had their uh, preference shift shifting to like non-dairy based milk in the past 10 years. But the older people still continue to come back to to I guess dairy milk and because like I guess that's what the, 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 the that's what they do is growing up and their, their preference is less likely to change as they they go they grow older and that's why because the, this group of people is getting larger and larger in terms of the percentage in the population we, we think that the demand has a higher probability of you know stabilizing than you know uh, being becoming more volatile in the future. And one more thing, the the kind of the growth of plant based milk has slowed considerably. So 100 billion market dairy milk, liquid milk is about you know 30 billion, um, plant based is about two and a half billion, and that's the growth was like really rapid a couple of years ago, and it's slowed considerably in the last uh, 18 or so months. So I really like what you guys did on the uh, recovery analysis and with the, uh, the PPD. Um, yeah, I can tell you did a lot of work there, but um, what you didn't include was the possibility of selling off some of the brands because it's very brand intensive and it's possible that they can, especially ice cream, they could, to the extent that they ran into a liquidity issue, could sell one of those brands or several of those brands to raise capital. Sure. Yeah, I don't think the brands have an ex Well, I think you're like historically, about five years ago, <laughs> when they experienced that spike in milk mm -hmm. price, they actually did um, spin off some of their not ice cream brands, but some of their yogurt brands. Just in terms of when they, when they experience like liquidity shortage. Yeah, and also you look at the recent transaction. Actually, there's a lot of um, buy and sells of brands among diary companies. So that's definitely some something possible if they want to sell the brands. And and finally, one more backstop that we were not able to include because this was included in the 10K that came out like just like after we presented our, our, our after we turned in our presentation. There's close to 80 million dollars in tax loss carry forwards that we have not included, which could as, act as an additional backstop in in, in case of liquidation, acquisition at least. Final question. Yeah. I guess given that free cash flow generation and uh, they, they've shown that. They would be open to, to making acquisitions, although it, it looks like they didn't make any in, in 2018. What, what do you think they aim for next? Are there any sort of strategic you know, brands out there that uh, you guys think would, would be a good fit for, uh, for Dean? Um, I think uh, very likely uh, once they, they finish their, well, obviously they're going through the cost cutting a uh, stage right now. So I don't think it, the likelihood is high uh, for, for them to, to acquire any brands in the next two years. But coming out of that, assuming the, the secular decline in milk continues and assuming the other sectors is going to continue outperform uh, dairy milk. So I think they, they will probably still invest in, in some of the categories we talked about, including non-dairy non, non based milk and organic juice. And another thing that, that I, I can think of is recently, one of the biggest demands uh, had, uh, that's, that's growing is actually flavored milk. So Dean does have one brand that's called True, uh, True Moo, which, which is positioned to, to take advantage of that growth. And if, if that sector continues to grow, I think they, they probably will also try to invest more of the, their, their capital investment. Thank you for your question. Hi, everyone. Uh, we are Team Epsilon. I'm Abdullah. This is Matt, and we're going to present AMC Entertainment uh, holding senior subordinated 2026 bonds. So the bond uh, currently is trading at 7.7% yield to worst. 
our target yield for this bond is 6.2%, which implies 150 basis points yield improvement going forward. The uh, inter enterprise value for AMC as a company is roughly $6.5 billion. So how are you going to pitch this company? We're going to first talk about how AMC exactly makes the money. Then we'll talk about key three investment thesis points that will substantiate our bullishness for this company. Then we'll talk about a specific catalyst that will unlock value for the bonds we are, we are pitching right now. And we'll discuss some of the financial implications and finally, the risk reward trade-off that we see uh, in 2026 bonds for AMC. So what does AMC do? We all know what AMC does. AMC is a movie theater chain uh, in America. And it operates in a very consolidated industry. The top three players in this space basically owns half the market share in movie theater business. And uh, after the recent acquisition of Audion and Nordic in Europe, AMC has become the largest player in movie theater business. And basically, a quarter of their revenue comes from overseas markets. So how does AMC make money? Well, primarily two ways. First, when you go to uh, watch a movie, you pay for the ticket price. And second, uh, more often than not, you also buy food and beverage products from the movie theaters you go to. And AMC actually makes a whopping 85% margin from this food and beverage, what they call concessions. And that's why, although 30% of their top line comes from concessions, 40% of their total gross profit comes from this particular segment because of the higher gross margin contribution to the overall company. So why are you bullish about movie theater business in the age of Netflix? If you look at the top left chart, that's an attendance uh, trend in the US for the last 25 years. We see two particular takeaways from this chart. First, if you look at the long-term trend, the 25-year CAGR, it's basically flat. Second, and more importantly, look at the last three-year growth trajectory. It has not in, like, drastically fallen compared to earlier times even though the Netflixes of the world has become more and more popular. In fact, when it comes to movie theater business, there was always something to be concerned about. In the early 90s, it was the VCR. Then came the internet, then came DVDs, and now it's a Netflix or streaming, streaming mania that you see all around. But in the meantime, box office revenue increased from 5 billion to 30, uh, 13 billion in the last 30 years. We believe there's a reason why going out for a movie still has its appeal. It's because look, looking at the other available options, movies provide such a value for money for the customers. And even though the attendance trend has been flat, the admission revenue kept increasing in the last 30 years because of the average ticket price increases, which more or less outpaces inflation in the US. And nowadays, when people go to watch movies, they want to watch movies through IMAX screens, through 3D screens. So that also helps AMC to charge higher prices for each ticket. And that also helps increase average ticket prices in America. All right, so let's talk about AMC's CapEx cycle. So over the last five years, AMC's CapEx to depreciation ratio has averaged about 140%. We expect that to decline to about 100% as they complete their installment of premium seating and about 38% of their screens. Why do we care about premium seating? Because premium seating, while it does reduce the number of seats in theaters, it increases attendance by 47%. And AMC you know, kind of makes up by raising ticket prices by about 9% after the first year of installation. And the biggest reason why we care about attendance increasing is food and beverage take rates. So essentially what food and beverage take rates are, in 2011, 64% of customers that were in attendance at movie theaters purchased concessions. That's up to about 70% in 2017. And since these, uh, since food and, food and beverage, you know, their margin is about 80% and they contribute about 40% to total gross profit, that's why these, these seats are, are, are essential. Um, They've been able to do this by increasing initiatives uh, related to dining services, increased offerings for uh, food and beverages uh, relating to uh, 
alcohol and different uh, burgers and, and, and quesadillas and things like that. And that's kind of given them the opportunity to lead the industry in concessions per capita relative to their peers. All right, so in terms of movie slates, over the last decade, 94% of the top 100 grossing films have been sequels. In 2019, 37 sequels are expected to be released. That's up from 32 in 2018. So we see that as a positive, it's gonna have a positive impact on revenue for the entire theater industry. Now looking at Disney, Disney is one of the biggest movie studios, uh, one of the most important uh, you know, relative to the other studios uh, for, for kind of keeping the, the theater industry alive uh, and generating revenue. In 2018, they released 10 movies and they expect to release 10 movies in 2019. So we don't see this as a negative, uh, of, you know, having a negative hit on their revenue like they did in 2017 when they only released eight films. All right, so now moving on to AMC's, you know, next biggest play, um, it's A-List. So they, they basically entered the Month, a monthly, it's a monthly subscription-based service that allows uh, uh, people that purchase it to go see three movies on a weekly basis. And while it does hurt the ticket price, uh, you know, it, it does affect the ticket prices and kind of lowers the ticket prices, it increases attendance. And that's what's key because more attendance means more food and beverage sales. Um, they launched a service in June of 2018 with the expect expectation of, of getting about 500,000 subscribers by June 2019. They hit that mark in five months. And they're already up to 700,000 by the end of December uh, 2018 after six months. Um, this has basically enabled them to increase prices across 15 states in this service. And they expect their incremental EBITDA uh, per 1 million subscribers to be about 15 to 25 million. And finally, uh, looking at AMC's uh, app in the Google Play Store, their rating is higher uh, than most of their peers. And that just further shows that they're really focused on uh, you know, providing their customer with the best possible product. In the near term, we see a significant catalyst coming for AMC bonds. And that is, the management talked about the possibility of AMC to list for an IPO for its European operations. So initially, uh, the timeline was uh, late 18 to early 19. Then they had to delay it to late 19 to early 20. So why did why they have to delay it? Because there was a World Cup, soccer World Cup going on in Europe. And the top four semifinalists in this, uh, in this soccer World Cup were all European teams. And the World Cup was also going on Russia, which is a European country. So uh, the whole uh, industry comms for movie theater suffered. And AMC didn't want to go, to go for an IPO when the comms are negative. If you look at the comms before uh, 2018, all the comms are extremely positive. So I, we believe 2019 is going to be an easy beat for the movie theater industry in Europe. And that's also going to help AMC to go for an IPO uh, in Europe. Now, why exactly AMC is interested in, in getting listed in Europe? So Cine World, which is their largest competitor in Europe, they are trading at 17 times EV to EBITDA multiple. When AMC gets less than seven times in, in America. And CEO uh, Adam uh, Aaron actually talked about it. Like since their uh, European operations are kind of hidden, in the whole consolidated business, it's not getting as much value as we'd have gotten if it were a separate company in Europe. That's why they're interested in getting listed in, uh, in, in London. And if they get 10 times, which is still like almost half what Senior World is trading at, if they get 10 times, that's going to lead $571 million IPO process if they sell 25% of the company. And that also is going to lead to a decline of net leverage from 5.3 times on an LTM basis to 4.7 times uh, after the IPO proceeds are considered. All right, so as far as our major assumptions, we tied all of our assumptions to each thesis point and each catalyst. Um, here's our EBITDA cal calculation. This is the base case. We expect EBITDA margins to expand uh, based on uh, contribution from food and beverage purchases. All right, then this is AMC's leverage profile. So their total secured debt is about 1.7 times. Total supporting their debt is about 5.1 times. And their net leverage is about 5.3 times on an LTM basis. Uh, if you look at, uh, on the top right, AMC's bond maturity wall, there's no principal due within the next three years. Their free cash flow of the firm in 2020 is about 530 million. And we expect their ratios to improve, uh, specifically the interest coverage ratio and the net leverage ratio 
uh, you know, into 2020 as the firm receives proceeds from the sale of the IPO and increases their EBITDA. To come up with our target yield uh, for the 2026 bonds, we have looked into the bonds for AMC across the credit curve. So if you look at this left chart, except for 2022 bonds, all the bonds in the longer end of the curve are trading closer to 52 week highs in terms of yields. And 2022 bonds are actually not very liquid. The issue size is only $375 million. So we are more interested in the longer end of the credit curve. Now, within the longer end of the curve, uh, between 25 and 26 bonds, the average spread between these two bonds uh, in last 52 weeks was 14 bips, 1-4. Right now, the bond has, uh, that spread has increased to 50 bips, 5-0. So we feel we are getting paid, we are getting adequately compensated for taking an extra duration risk for 26 bonds rather than 25 bonds. Now, comparing between 26 and 27 bonds, the, uh, the spread between these two bonds are only 10 bips. So we don't feel compensated for the extra duration risk that we'll be taking for 27 bonds. So we prefer 26 bonds within the capital structure of AMC. Now, looking at the debt comp, after the IPO proceeds are taken, uh, are considered, and the EBITDA expansion that Matt and I talked about in our investment thesis points, we expect the net leverage to go down from 5.3 times to 3.8 times in two years. And that will lead to unlocking of value for the uh, 26 bonds uh, that we're pitching right now. So let's talk about some major risk. So whenever you talk about movie, movie industry business, movie theater business, uh, everyone keeps talking about this video on demand window, which has been shrinking for years, and it is a risk. We, we do acknowledge that. But what has been lost in translation is the fact that within first six weeks, more than 90% of the box office revenue is actually realized for the movies. So unless and until the average video window is decreased from 3.5 weeks to 1.5 weeks, I don't think it's going to be a game changer for AMC anytime soon. And bondholders didn't like the deal that AMC made uh, with Silver Lake in September 2018. So what is the deal about? AMC issued 600 million senior unsecured convertible debt with six-year maturity at 2.9%. And then what they did is uh, they paid a special dividend, which really annoyed the bondholders. And understandably so, and also the fact that this senior unsecured bond is higher in the capital structure, waterfall, so that bond didn't definitely enjoy uh, that particular deal. But we do, think, we do think on an overall basis, this, is a, this deal makes sense for the company. Why is that? This deal is cash flow accretive even in 2019. So currently the stock of this company is trading at like 5% yield, uh, dividend yield. So they are, and they finance this uh, debt with 2.9%. So overall, this is a cash flow equity uh, for the company uh, going forward. And the fact that Wanda, uh, the uh, Chinese conglomerate, uh, one of the largest stakeholders, shareholder for this company, has been a major hangover for, uh, for both the credit holders and the uh, shareholders. Because market was kind of uh, you know, anxious about how they are exactly going to liquidate their holdings because there was some press report that they have to liquidate uh, based on the urgency of Chinese government. Now, this deal, basically with the $600 million, they basically paid $160 million uh, special dividend. They uh, purchased uh, $140 million of, uh, $140 million of uh, their stocks uh, from the market. And uh, basically, the $20 million is still in the balance sheet. And the fact that Silver, Silver Lake's interest uh, in this movie theater business, we, we feel that's a stamp of approval of the fact that uh, MC is not in a structurally uh, declining industry. So, uh, when I'm, uh, and they also they are going to sit in the board. And the fact that their conversion price is 18.95, which is 35% from the current stock price, also convinced us they're not, MC is not going to pay a special dividend anymore because that's gonna you know, take a hit from the conversion price perspective. So we did tweak some assumptions uh, for our BRK scenarios, and we found out even after we spread, uh, stressed some of our assumptions, and uh, if, even if we assume no IPO uh, in, in near future, we don't see significant downside from the current yield the bond is trading at. So we feel, uh, given the risk reward trade-off, we feel very comfortable in recommending overall position to AMC 26 bonds. Thank you very much. So, uh, I don't know if this was covered, but a AMC, I'm guessing, is publicly traded? Yes. It's not, and it's trading for seven times? 
Yes, why, on an EV2EV basis. Why do you think there's such a large divergence between that and Cineworld? world? So to explain that, part of it explain, is explained by this. Yeah. So if you look at the European attendance growth in the uh, last five years, except for 2018, the attendance growth has been significantly higher compared to uh, what you have seen in North America. And Cineworld is basically, uh, used to be the largest player in Europe. Right now, they are the second. So uh, the fact that they have a huge chunk of operations in Europe and the European market is uh, actually seeing a lot of secular positive trend in terms of attendance. Uh, so that kind of led to uh, some of the multiple expansion that uh, you are seeing. Uh, but at the same time, it really does not explain the whole story. It does not, uh, we feel, deserve the uh, three times multiple that uh, Senior World is trading compared to AMC. So the, we, we do think there is a, some sort of uh, undervaluation for AMC uh, in the market. So then, uh, what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at a pawn that's trading a little bit wide of the index and yeah. you know, it looks fairly safe, but I guess the case you're making here is that there's a catalyst with the potential IPO of a European <laughs> subsidiary, basically. Yeah. So basically it's an asset sale where they sell 25% of their equity ownership in a, in a sub. Equity. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so that's just uh, 10 times, uh, yeah. just the math here on slide, uh, no slide number, but the 228 I'm guessing is the European sub EBITDA. Yeah times by 25%, times it by 10, and you get 571 of proceeds. Yes. Pay down debt, and basically then you're left with debt reduction of approximately 571, but EBITDA, basically, what's your new pro forma EBITDA? Is that what that incorporates when you get to the 4.7? Yes, yes. So that, uh, after we adjust for that, that's a, uh, uh, sorry, that's a leverage that we'll be looking at. So we consider it like 75% EBITDA on, in our base case scenario going forward from the international markets. And do you, do you really anticipate a lot of spread tightening from, at that point? Like, is there a total return target? Uh, you compute any sort of expected total return once that occurs? So we focus mainly on the spreads. Uh, so, sorry, yeah, so on the yields, yield to worse. So right now, this bond is trading at 7.7%. So after the decline of leverage, we expect some un unlocking of value that will be coming to play uh, after the IPO, IPO process you know, coming to the balance sheet. How do you quantify that? Like, how did you come up with that, that estimate of 150 basis points of tightening? OK. So yeah, so if, if you look at that, so. Cinemark, uh, which is a company like peer for MC. So we looked at we looked into the uh, bonds they are trading at. So they are right now at 2.5 times leverage, and they're trading at uh, and 23 bonds are trading at like 250, uh, 240, uh, you know, bips. So we expect after the IPO proceeds and EBITDA expansion, uh, AMC bonds will be trading definitely higher because Cinemark's uh, leverage would still be lower than AMC. But we expect uh, a significant compression of spreads that we are seeing in the market. Uh, are following the IPO uh, process and uh, the lead expansion that we, we assumed going forward. So there's some linear interpol uh, interpolation. Sorry? Some linear interpolation. You yeah, so some sort of, yeah. Yeah. A significant part of the profits are coming from concessions. And yeah. a lot of these new traders have been appendages of the smalls. We've seen a lot of mall closures over the years. And the ones that are opening are opening with a lot of food uh, competition and the food at movie theaters isn't very good, but the food amongst the malls are getting increasingly better. Don't you see a decline in food concession on a go forward basis relative to what it's been historically? Right. So AMC has realized, like for for them for them to survive in this market in the long run, they have to focus a lot on concessions. Like that's basically their cash cow. They're making a chunk of their money from concessions. And that's why Matt talked about how they have expanded their uh, food offerings. And they realized the criticism that customers have about the food offerings made, made from movie theaters. And they did come up with a you know, significant expansion of uh, food offerings in terms of uh, now you can buy burgers and alcohols, even you, know, you, you can have dining experience uh, within the movie theaters. And also they are, they are also coming up with some uh, liaison with some you know, chains. So uh, 
that. Yeah, so they they they're they're ta- I know they're talking with different chains, uh, you know, ranging from Subway to McDonald's to possibly kind of put that in the theaters be- before you actually go into the in, into the movie. So you're going to be buying a product that um, you know is good, you know is quality. Uh, you know, whereas I feel like in the past a lot of people do worry that they're getting a, a, a you know a in, you know, inferior product when they buy it from a movie theater. So by having chains in, I think that will also help as well. And being able to have that dine-in service too, so you don't got to kind of get up out of your seat and you could, you could order the food while you're at your seat, I think also is you know, beneficial with these uh, new premium seating offerings. Yeah, would that dramatically increase the CapEx? So uh, in terms of CapEx, management had a lot of guidance in the yesterday's call, they, would, they just declared. So they did a lot of guidance in terms of what CapEx is going to be in the long term, meaning three, in three to five years. So basically the CEO say, Street is expect, like, estimating a lot, lot more CapEx than uh, they would probably need. So 38% of their theaters are, uh, like go, are gone through the renovations and the recliners that they uh, made investments into in the last five years. So in 2021, they will have to add 4% more. So from 38% to 42%. Uh, they'll reach that level in 2021. So there's not a growth capex that, that will be coming into play. So they expect in three to five years, capex of like 250 to 300 million. That's a decline of 500 million to 300 million. That's a 200 million dollar that's going to add to free cash flow uh, probably in the long run. Uh, and actually, it's actually much more capex heavy when you are renovating your seats than comparing to when you are actually trying to work with your you know, concession offerings. So it's not a lot of capex investment. It's more of a tweaking and strategic orientation that we are changing. And so I, we don't expect a significant capex coming up for uh, for, for those ends. And we actually, so we didn't know, like, you know, they're going to talk about the capex in, in yesterday's call. We, we submitted it before the call happened. And we, ex- we actually assumed $500 million, which is in line with the depreciation. So we expect 100% capex to depreciation ratio, especially given the fact that they have 140% on an average capex to depreciation ratio when they renovated their recliner seats uh, in the last five years. They, oh, sorry. Just to follow up to that, if they bring in franchises and you know like, like a McDonald's, wouldn't that lower their margins? They would. I mean, yes. So that that would. They would, and uh, we don't like that. The sort of that's the sort of details uh, we don't have. Uh, like what exactly they are going to do in terms of strategy and how much cut McDonald's or KFCs are going to make and uh, what's the cut for for, uh, for AMC or other movie theaters. Uh, that's a development that we have to keep looking as bond investor for this company. Uh, but yeah, that, that, would be a, uh, that, would, that would be a development that we should de- definitely keep a close eye. Many of the investment VCs that you listed in Catalyst um, could also pertain to why you would be bullish on equity. So can you just reiterate why if you just had um, a set amount of dollars to spend, you are going to spend it on the bonds and not the equities? We feel very, uh, we feel much more comfortable in going for the bond rather than the equity uh, for AMC. Uh, we do acknowledge there are some risks out there. Uh, so uh, for example, we think that, uh, uh, for example, the average video release window. So this is a long-term risk, and uh, as, as shareholders, uh, it would be difficult sell uh, to take in, to, in, to t- take real investment in an industry or in, the, in a company, which may have some uh, in a long-term risk. Uh, for bondholders, we have a certain maturity, and we feel very confident in in the next uh, twenty years. But for stock shareholders, it may not uh, be very comfortable investing in this company. <coughs> And then do you think the, bo- the bonds are going to be called in 2021? It is possible. Uh, it is definitely possible. And so that's why we looked at yield to worse and not just yields. So if it is called, uh, you know, we are still making uh, say 7.2%, which uh, the bond is currently trading at. And you said uh, 38% of the uh, theaters have been upgraded. Yeah. Um, and when you do, there's a 47% bump in attendance. I mean, it sounds like that's a really good return on their investment. So why do you think they're declining the CapEx spend if, um, if that could be you know, such a good return and there's still so many deals that have been invested? So if you look at the uh, average price increases, so when they do the recliners, uh, CapEx, they don't increase their average ticket price right away. They wait for a year, and after a year, they increase it by 9%. 
but uh, MC realizes there's not market for that sort of uh, you know uh, offering uh, everywhere in, in America. So people in New York, in California, in, in Chicago, people, people might be more inclined to pay more for the service they get, but people in, uh, in some rural areas or some not so well-off areas may not have the demand uh, you know, that for, for the recliner sitting out there. So we, we don't think if they make it like 100%, uh, or if, or if they make all the theaters uh, with recliners, uh, we wouldn't see the same sort of uh, like numbers that you are looking at. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. We are Team Zeta. Again, it is our great pleasure to pr present the re our recommendation and the results of our research. Uh, thank you for your time and for your hospitality today. <coughs> Bottom line up front, our recommendation is a sell position on Netflix's 10 and a half year, <coughs> 5 and 7 eighths percent bond, maturing November 2028. We believe that its current price of 103.75 is overvalued, and that as after the as the fundamentals are considered by the credit rating agencies, Netflix will face a like a likely credit rating downgrade by the second quarter of 2020, triggering a revaluation to a target price of 81.43. Now, why would something this drastic occur? Is a fair question, and we will today we'll examine three strategic headwinds that Netflix is facing that we believe will drive this revaluation of their risk profile and their debt. First, the strategic constraints of debt. Those stage firms like Netflix should prioritize equity financing over debt in order to preserve strategic flexibility. Netflix's streaming con content obligations further restrict their ability to react to market and competitive conditions. This in an aggressively competitive environment in which their competitive advantage is weakening. Netflix is also reliant on expensive licensed content from suppliers who are becoming their key competitors. And this is forcing a reaction in which they have to develop more original content at great cost, leading to a long-term chronic cash deficit in which they require external cash to finance their continued market expansion. And then as they raise more and more of that debt, will stretch its financial profile relative to comparable media firms, in the end leading to a situation where the credit agencies must reevaluate their rating and will downgrade Netflix's bonds. First, we'll examine the strategic constraints of debt. First, growth stage firms like Netflix should prioritize equity financing over debt. Debt service robs growth stage firms of necessary flexibility. They require that flexibility to invest in sources of revenue and market share, which are the key drivers of value for firms of this, of this age, this um, life cycle. And research has shown that firms preferring flexibility will tend to use leverage below their carrying capacity. Why? Because the cash flow obligations of debt and other obligations will draw cash away from investment opportunities, constricting their decision space. Further, the costs of financial distress are higher for tech firms. Uh, intangible assets can't be, used as can't be used as collateral in the event of bankruptcy. And as Netflix's competitive position declines due to competition, those intangible assets will, may also be impaired, impacting the company's ability to seek further funding, whether through equity or debt markets. The important thing here is not that we believe that Netflix is, is going to go belly up but rather that these risks and the costs involved should be taken into account by the firm before they turn to the debt markets as early and as often as they have. Further, they're taking on streaming obligations that further restrict their financial flexibility. The, these streaming content obligations displayed from beginning in 2013 and on to 2018 have increased dramatically. While this is not technically debt, this is spending they have committed to. They, they can't change their minds on this. It's already, it's already signed. And this is a, another source of constrained flexibility in the face of market changes. And with that, we will discuss the worsening strategic situation for Netflix with my colleague, Carlos. Thanks, Gary. Now let's analyze the competitive landscape for Netflix. Netflix's competitive 
advantages weakening. We acknowledge that they, they are the current market leaders for global streaming video. They are producing high quality content, as one can see by its recent Oscars and Emmys nominations. And it's also a fact that it's, uh, there is an increasing global demand for video streaming. But at the same time, more and more suppliers are transforming into competitors like Disney, Warner, and NBCU. And it's important to highlight that those companies don't rely on streaming video as a source of cash. They have other business streams as well. And they are well known for producing high quality content also. Last year in the US, Hulu actually added more subscribers than Netflix. And it's important to notice that Amazon Prime customers have the possibility to add uh, different channels on top of their basic plan. Netflix is reliant on expensive licensed content. As we can see on this chart here, out of the 10 most viewed TV shows in 2018, only one is actually produced by Netflix. The rest of them are licensed uh, by its future competitors like Disney, Warner. And the question is, why would a competitor license its own content to Netflix? But Netflix has reacted by developing original content at great cost. As we can see on this chart, the company plans to ramp up the content creation expenditures over the next years. Uh, reaching $21 billion by 2029. And the main question that remains is, does Netflix have the steam or financial power to support that expenditure? Now I'm, I will hand it to my colleague Fabian to walk us through the financials. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Um, has Netflix forced itself to expand and to internationalize its sales, with sales expected to reach 100 billion US dollars in 2028, it becomes more and more dependent on raising external cash, in particular debt. As Netflix raises more and more debt, it stretches its financial profile extremely relative to comparable media companies with similar credit ratings. So as a consequence, credit rating agencies will be forced to downgrade the bond of Netflix. So we expect in the second quarter of 2020. So this graph shows in the bottom, the cash flow from operating activities between 2019, 17, and 2027, and in the top, the cash flow from outside financing. Netflix, according to our management projections, burns more and more cash, and it will need to raise 85 billion US dollars to finance this cash burn. Management says that most of this cash will come from debt. This is um, part of their management strategies. And as Netflix raises more and more uh, debt, it will stretch its financial profile relative to comparable media companies with similar credit ratings. These companies with similar credit ratings include, for instance, Discovery and CBS Corporation. Now, even now in 2018, most financial ratios of Netflix are worse than these comparable media companies. As Netflix will raise even more debt, these financial ratios will continue to worsen, with, in 2020, just the EBIT margin of 7.9% a debt to equity ratio of 2.7 and a coverage ratio of 3.7.
In the end, credit rating agencies must acknowledge that the financial ratios of Netflix in 2020 will be more similar to financial ratios of media companies with a rating between B plus to B minus instead of the current rating of BB minus, which is in the bucket of BB plus to BB minus. So they must then, the credit rating agencies must reevaluate Netflix and come to the conclusion <coughs> that it deserves a credit rating of B. As a consequence, the yield will increase from around 5.4% to 8.75%, which is according to our analyzers, the median yield for media um, companies with a with a credit rating between B plus and B minus. And so to reiterate, we do recommend sell position on Netflix's 10 and a half year, five and seven eighths percent bond maturing November of 2028. Its price is overinflated. We do expect a downgrade in 2020 and we have target price 8143. So our recommendation, put plainly, is if it's, if it's in the portfolios or on the books, let's get out of it. And if someone comes in selling it, thank them for their time and show them the door. And with that, we're open to your questions. I appreciate uh, how you guys have sort of taken you know, a different route and actually recommended a short. Um, well, to, to, be, to be certain, not, not a short, but, but rather a sell to, 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 exp to reduce or, or eliminate exposure. Okay. Um, but I guess, uh, I guess how would, I guess I have been in the mindset that you were recommending shorting this, uh, which I guess it, indirectly you, you sort of are, right? You're, you're saying you wouldn't, uh, uh, you wouldn't be buying it. I get it, I guess with the information you've given, um, you know, without a capital structure or other parts of the debt complex to take a look at, um, you know, how did you choose this particular security versus anything else in, in that capture? We chose this security because uh, because first it was issued in April of April. 2018 at a time when I would say confidence in Netflix's ability to overcome the, to overcome the headwinds in front of it was much higher, I'd say, than, than we should expect to be going forward. Um, further, we've had, time to, we've had time to evaluate the market's reaction and its, its application of, of what we started to call the Netflix confidence premium to the, to the debt in a way that we wouldn't be able to for the debt that was issued later in the year, in, in October. And as, as this is the longest maturity debt that they, that, they, that they have out, that again, we've had time to, that gave us enough time to evaluate the market's treatment of it, we felt this was, this was the best tool to demonstrate our lack of confidence in their, in their debt financing strategy. And in this particular bond, it, why specifically do you think it's going to happen in Q2 of 2020? There's a very, there are two very important things happening in April of, 20, of this year. The, the first is that Disney is going to announce its rollout plan and content slate and user experience, for lack of a better word, for the Disney Plus platform. The, a few days after that, Netflix announces the first of its do or die results calls. That's just with the potential for Disney's impact on their, on their growth and future cash flows. About a year out from that, we're going to get another Q1 results call. And quite frankly, I would lay money that Disney will have another very interesting Disney Plus results call targeted to disrupt Netflix's, Netflix's uh, discussion of Netflix's performance. This is an environment where brands like Disney, through its positioning, through its um, interest in acquiring another platform like Hulu, has, taken a, has put a bullseye on Netflix. And we feel that in a year's time, 
that strategy will have, will have had time to uh, finish cooking, so to speak. And people will be talking a lot about how Netflix doesn't really have a plan for the future. So you don't think the current relationships are sticky in any way that loyal customers? We took advantage of some in internal polling data at, at our school and uh, found that people in the fat part of the fat part of Netflix's target market, young professionals, say 25 to 35, 39.8% of those polled said they want to reduce their streaming time. These are not people who are interested in having a, a broad portfolio of streaming opportunities. They're not interested in, in hanging on to a, a um, sentimental attachment to the, the, their first streaming service. These are people whose time is precious, who will be faced with, especially if Netflix is, uh, loses its high quality content to its future competitor, example, uh, Disney or Warner, yeah. and yes, so. Exactly. It will, it will be a market that rewards the best, con the, the best content play, and that, is, that begins to, to compete on price. These are not two things that first movers typically like to do. So the risk is that they actually have very good original content, creates an asset that could potentially be monetized. That is a risk, but we feel that it is not a significant one. So you assign a low probability to that outcome? I, I do, for the following reasons. There is, there is currently a, a bidding war on for the, the services of actors. Um, somewhat recently, you saw Jerry Seinfeld uh, sign a $60 million con contract to put people in a car and take them to coffee shops. Um, this is a great time to be a content producer. There, are, there will be a rush for content, especially from platforms who are not attached to, as Carlos pointed out, gold-plated creative brands, which all respect due to, to shows like Fuller House, Netflix has not really shown itself to be. So you feel the, the price of the stock and the bond are priced to perfection that Netflix will continue to grow and meet the expectations of the market, whereas you see a, a pretty you know, hairy situation with competition coming in. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and well, to, I'm sorry, to price to price to perfection. Perfection. You're saying the current, the, the current, the current bond and the stock. Well, overpriced. Oh, dollar point. Yeah. Our, our point. Yeah. Yes. Definitely overpriced. But as I as I said, we we found the um, the, the Netflix confidence premium is, is definitely in effect right now. So there's been a oh no go there's been a dead issue since the early to mid 2000s, right? Yes. Um, how correlated are bond prices and yields with uh, the equity price? To the equity price? That's not a that's not a number I can give you right now. Would be happy to take a look and, and give you that that data. Yeah, I was just gonna kind of sit, uh, address something similar to that is that you know the rating agencies, but also the market just has given. I mean these these metrics and the. It's 20 times levered when you really add those content liabilities. Like So the market has kind of shunned away traditional valuation metrics when it looks at both the equity and the debt mm -hmm. here. The, I guess you're articulating that we're about to hit an inflection point where finally um, there's some you know, inflection in, in the fundamentals that says, okay, now is the time we're going to re-rate the security. We're not going to think about it as a 20 times levered and a 100 times EV you know, enterprise value. Yeah, I, I, I agree with your thesis. I'm just thinking what what will be that catalyst because the market's overlooked it for quite some time. That premium you said, it's been there for a long time. There's a difference between things that everyone knows and things that everyone knows everyone knows. Everyone knows that Netflix is over leveraged. Everyone knows that Netflix is trying to spin their way out of competitive hole. What what keeps it from becoming that, that common assumed knowledge, things that everyone knows, everyone knows, is the lack of a clear, sticky rival who is going to be right at their heels every day, not only keeping them, not only keeping them honest in competitive terms, but also making sure to do damage to their brand at every turn, the way that a Disney bolstered by the Fox content library likely will. And again, I would point to their timing of their rollout call. You know, they could have picked any, any day in April 
but they happen to pick one just a few days before the expected results call. And that, that, that speaks to mindset. And in terms, and further, in terms of sort of the, the mechanism by which a price correction can be, can be realized, once, once the story about Netflix changes from a, oh, markets have changed, or valuations have changed, to, wow, why, why, why aren't we paying more attention to Netflix? Look what Disney's doing to them. Suddenly, that's a conversation that has to happen in front, for, between consultants and their, their institutional clients. That's a conversation that has to happen between analysts and investment committees. These are painful conversations, and people will have to find to choose between expending professional and social capital to defend Netflix debt and finding another source for cash flow. At which point you see the downward price pressure and the price correction begins. I guess uh, this is sort of going back to my original but why not just recommend a short then in this case? I mean your money manager. It's a 103, maybe you made three and three quarters points. You're going to sell it. And yeah, you think it's 20 points you know, too expensive, but during that time, you're not making any money. If you do have the confidence, um, you, know, you pay this coupon and, and you make 20 points in a little over a year. Um, you know, I guess what prevented you? Did you guys think about it? Or we, we, examined, we, we examined the possibility of short. Sorry to talk over you. Please, no, no, please no. finish. No, that's we examined the possibility of a short. Um, publicly available CDS data for Netflix debt is zero. It, from, from what we were able to uh, accomplish, we were able to, from what data we were able to examine, we, we saw no, no signs of, again, publicly available C CDS uh, information. We have, we have read about short pressure on Netflix bonds, specifically including this bond. But again, these markets and, and these, these short traders make their money by being opaque, by, by not telling people what they're doing and when they expect to close their shorts. As such, we, we didn't have data that would let us present a, a short recommendation with conviction. Can you talk a little bit about, is this a similar trajectory that's happening with Pierre? So you noted that more people subscribe to Hulu than Netflix in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, is Hulu making a lot more per subscriber than Netflix is? And kind of, you know, what does that landscape look like? To, to uh, something that Carlos had mentioned earlier, something that is more, I think, more important than, than say, per, per subscriber revenue is the overall health of the organization that is, that, that is marketing a streaming service. <clears throat> we're, we're, when we talk about these key competitors to Netflix, we look at Disney or mm -hmm. NBC Universal. When we look at when we look at their their peers again, we're looking at more diversified, more diversified revenue streams than a single streaming service. That having to grow one market at an increasing rate in, while while facing these competitive pressures, and so rather than rather than looking primarily at the, at the streaming at the streaming revenue situation, we felt it more useful to ask what are they bringing that Netflix isn't that keeps them from having to do what Netflix does which is issue junk bonds with increasing regularity. So I think one of their big initiatives now is internationally. Um, mm -hmm. They just announced that that's going to be a focus for them. Uh, did you consider that? And I mean, when you've already spent the capital for the content, being able to grow your subscriber base internationally comes at almost a marginal cost of zero. Uh, to the extent you're able to gain subscribers. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. The main point there uh, right, is that we we are, when you mention that you, as I understood you, assume that Netflix will keep its content uh, platform. But our thesis is that as soon as its competitors launches its own streaming services, that licensed content won't be there anymore. Mm -hmm. So the quality of their platform will go down. And mm -hmm. in, a, in a scenario that we actually have eight, nine options, uh, they won't have the first mover advantage anymore. That's how we see it. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. 
they're, they're in an interesting position where their their content that they the content that they are selling is is also one of their key one of their key marketing pieces and <coughs> as such the the marginal value of attracting those international users viewed from through that lens rises dramatically as they have to increase their their content spend in an environment where as i said it's, it's a very good time to be making content and selling it to streaming streaming services and suddenly have to compete internationally against brands that have global reach that stretches back decades. I actually don't know, is Disney Plus planning to launch internationally or is it just North America? They're, they're playing their cards very close to the vest. Again, this comes to, again, this comes to the April rollout call. Mm -hmm. And at a lower price point than Netflix, I think it's it's thirty percent less than, than the less costly. Yeah, of Netflix. But if I mean the content gets famous here in the United States of America, it is kind of simple to internationalize it and to with low costs, you know, generate the access in Europe and Asia <coughs> and Latin America. So that's also um, a tremendous threat to the sales. No project sales off of Netflix. Definitely, it is a much easier ask to to generalize the appeal of The Incredibles two than it is to generalize the appeal of of um, BoJack Horseman. Let's say. Question on uh, the content liabilities. So, if you're looking at like 2017, for example, yes, sir. Uh, the less than one year. I'm guessing that's what's due within one year. It's I don't know about half that. Let's just call it eight billion. Uh, slide, sorry, slide numbers. right there. Yes. Okay. So that red bar in 2017 is eight billion, mm -hmm. and I know there's some other uh, yes. spend for internally generated IP or content development. Yes. Uh, but let's just use this eight billion. How was that funded in 2018? The cash. The th this is in part what led to their negative operating cash flow. Mm -hmm. The revenues that came in, the operating revenues that came in were insufficient to cover that. And this is where you start to see them bring in more debt to cover this, to, to cover this, um, to cover these, these basically non-debt obligations. So the shortfall was debt financed. Yes. Debt and, financed. And also uh, equities were raised one million, uh, one billion years ago. So it was equity and debt. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. So then do you think Netflix, it would be within their best interest, or would it, how do you think they're thinking about the the shift uh, or the, the split between funding these cash shortfalls with debt and with equity? Because I guess your thesis is predicated on the fact that it's going to be primarily debt. Yes, it's, um, our, according to our projections, the 85 billion US dollars will be financed, 60 billion US dollars will be financed through debt, and the remaining 25 billion. U.S. dollars will be financed through equities. Um, where would you get that information? The that um, funding we got from from the 10K, uh, in which they say there that they plan to fund the content uh, expanded through that because they understand that that is cheaper than that than equity mm -hmm. and the percentage uh, it was an assumption that we made right uh, it's an assumption based also on on on, um, on emma's reports about you know uh projected uh projected financial so this management hasn't uh, communicated capital like a leverage policy or anything. they communicated that they want to uh, use more debt finance through that yes yeah and this is this brief oh sorry it's on the earth thing, the last one. And this also raises an interesting point that you find on the, the bond indenture, where they, they go into their debt covenants and they begin to describe, and they begin to describe the um, sort of debt discipline that they are, that, that, that they in, intend to impose. But then, of course, you read deeper into the covenants and you find that they are excluding debt related to the acquisition of content. And it's uh, and this this is tax again. We we'd be happy to pull it from the we'd be happy to pull pull it from the eight k with with the relevant sections highlighted and, and distribute after. If that if you know, if if there is interest. How much can they raise their or can they raise their subscription fees to kind of stop this 
you know, yes. swirl that you guys yeah. are talking to. Um, they, they just raised it, so. Yes, mm -hmm. they raised it like almost from 11 to 12.99 dollars uh, recently. The reports that, that we saw, uh, the analysts said that they basically are kept on uh, at those rates because of the increasing competition that will start uh, from uh, Disney, Warner, and all of those channels and <clears throat> media companies. Very, very negative uh, signs that they'll be able to, to continue to raise prices. There, there's a lot of negative price pressure out there. We also, I mean, in the past, the um, demand has been less um, price elastic, um, but with more competition entering the market, and uh, you know that the customers have more different programs to select from. We expect um, that actually the demand will become more um, uh, price elastic. <coughs> Any more question? So, from a portfolio manager perspective sell Netflix and buy a movie theater? <laughs> <laughs> that, that gets into a buy recommendation that we are not prepared to present this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.